can. And we will praise you again and again because you are worthy of it, Father. Have your way in this service, Lord. Every song, Lord, let it be sung for your glory. Every note that is played, let your name be praised. And we'll be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Somebody say amen. By and by.
name, hallelujah. Lord, I love you, hallelujah. Lord, we thank you, hallelujah. Lord, we love you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, hallelujah.
It's here today. It's here every day. Hallelujah. He hears your heart. Yes, he does. Hallelujah, Lord. We praise your name. Hallelujah, Lord. You're so good. Lord, you're so wonderful. You're so marvelous. Jesus at your center today? How many want Jesus at the center of everything that you do? Hallelujah. Every situation that comes upon you, would you put Jesus at the center of it? Hallelujah. He will move. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Lord, we love you, Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Say Jesus, Jesus at the center of it all. Come on, say it like you mean it today. Say Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end. Beginning to the end. Oh, oh always be. It's always been. Nothing is 
everybody can say this. Jesus be the center of your church. We want Jesus to be the center of your church. You know every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess you Jesus. How many know it's going to confess him Jesus? Oh, it shall confess you
God a hand clap. Hallelujah. You may be seated. When it ceases to be about him, we don't need to come together. Amen. When it ceases to be about him, you have lost the essence of life. For it is in Jesus. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to his name. You notice it didn't say singing key. I get off every now and then. I'll be the first to admit. But when you talk about his righteousness and his goodness, I don't need a key. I just need to know who he is and what he's done for me. And when I think of his goodness and all he's done for me, if you can't find my key, get with me anyway. Because he is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. My, 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 he's worthy. Oh, he's worthy. You know he is. He is good. Hallelujah. 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 I grew up in a tradition. They used to sing a song like this. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me. Well, my soul cries out.
house of the Lord, I can't forget what he's done for me. You know, I grew up, they have, they didn't do service like we did. They just opened up with a devotion service, they call it. And they would sing songs like that till somebody was falling out, rolling over, fold up chairs were being smashed. People from out the street was coming in wanting to know what was going on. It was the joy of the Lord just flowing through the church. People who had come off of drugs was praising God. People who had come out of sin, whatever that sin was, was giving God glory. And, you know, just the name Jesus made fire in the church, you know. They would just call the name Jesus and things begin to happen. And, but without, without even an altar, they would end up with people up at the altar praying and crying out to the Lord. Because somebody out of the sense of worship got a closeness to God that they realized I am undone like Isaiah and I need him and what? Woe is me. I am undone. I'm a wretch. I need Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. Everybody. Hallelujah. Everybody needs Jesus. Your background might not be mine, and I'm glad we're not all the same. But God brought us, and thank God for Jesus. If it had not been for Jesus, let's give Jesus a hand clap. You know, we go to services, and we hear people take Long amounts of time celebrating people with titles. And when we talk about the Lord, they just give him a half do, a little, little praise and clap. And then spend minutes, I mean time, just celebrating people. Honor is due to whom honor due, but I believe the greater honor belongs to the Lord. And if you never mention my name and put a title with it, it's okay. I don't need it. We need to give him praise. We need his presence in here. You get so caught up with me, next thing you know, you'll be calling this Wiley's Temple and some old funny stuff going on, and we can't let people die because we done celebrated them instead of the Lord. I'm getting off now, but that's just one of my rant and rays for first Sunday of May, amen? Let's celebrate the Lord. Thank God for the people the Lord used, but let's remember the Lord used those people. To God be the glory for the things he has done. I mean, we name the street, the church, everything after people and celebrate them. And we can't even have service for having to mention people. Let's mention the Lord. Because the Bible, last time I checked, said, except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain, they that build it. He didn't say they can't build it and won't do it. Because you can get enough people behind you and you can build a Taj Mahal. That's why it's standing. You can build edifices tall and great, but it's only what you do for Christ that's going to last. God bless you. Give yourselves a hand clap. Good to see each and every one. God bless you, those who have joined in with us. I am excited. I feel welcome, and I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. I live for Sunday. Amen. I make it through the rest of the week to get to Sunday and Wednesday and be in the fellowship of believers. And when I'm not with you, I'm thinking about you because my inheritance are among them who are sanctified. Our Bible study night is taking a turn. Brother Arthur did a marvelous job. He allowed me to sit back and get rest and share. He took our passage on the wall and broke it down. He broke it down. God has thoughts concerning us. And while yet somebody was trying to embed in the mind of people one thing, God used Jeremiah to instill his thoughts. Many of people are saying a lot of things. I was, you go on YouTube, boy, there's all kind of stuff being said. But the Lord said, I know the thoughts I think toward you. Man might make a plan, but I got a plan that supersedes everybody else's. Amen. He shared that with us, and boy, was it a blessing. Our Wednesday nights are going to take a turn. We just finished the book of John. Did we learn something or not? Man, John taught us something, man. I got much love and respect the Gospel of John. We're going to start Paul's letter to the book of Galatians starting on Wednesday night. Not a very long chapter, but it's packed with a lot of information. I'm going to ask you to read that chapter as much as you can every day. Read that chapter. Just a couple, what, five chapters, whatever. Read, read the book of Galatians. We're going to do an introduction to the book on Wednesday night, and then we're going to do a verse-by-verse -verse study. You know what I mean by verse by verse, don't you folks? We're going to break it down and we're going to extract all we can and 
There'll still be left some more sandwiches to get out of it, but we'll get what we can get while we can, and can what we can get, and get what we can while we can, get what we can, and get it. We gonna get it, amen? Paul wrote this letter to a church that was really in trouble. A mission-minded church that was founded, and yet they were being moved because of heresy and false preaching. You'll see the danger and the damage that false preaching has done to our society as well as to the church at Galatia. He made a statement to them. He said, I marvel. Yeah. You are so soon. It happens so quick. That's why you got to be careful. Any preacher that don't guard this pulpit, I'm scared of that pulpit. Any pastor that's not really careful about what's being said and done and who say what's being said and done in this church is a loose cannon. And I'm telling you, you can put somebody up that can do more damage than they do good, and you got to spend months cleaning up what he done messed up in 20 minutes, or whatever the time be. But either way, the book, the Church of Galatia, uh, the letter written to them by Paul, was to help correct false doctrine. We're going to dive into it, and you will be blessed. I know you will. Come, study with us, learn and grow, and you will be encouraged. It's prayer time now. We get ready to pray. I cannot tell you how important it is in this hour that we hear from him and that we are drawn to his mindset. Your concerns, you're not careful, anxiety will set in. And we all have been there. We've been anxious for things and tried to make it happen in our own only to find out they that wait upon the Lord shall get renewed strength. And um, I was listening to a pastor who was sharing about an elderly bishop he knew. And he said, brother preacher, God's all right. He's just so slow. That was his comment. God just so slow. Because we in our mind, and I understood what he meant as he said it, we want God to move right in that situation. Quick. And there are times God does move quick, and there are times God moves in a way that causes us to have to wait. And you know how we are about waiting. But if we wait, we learn that in standing still, we see God's salvation, and we walk away from those experiences with a greater testimony, an in-depth. But anything easy many a times is not appreciated. It's when that effort and hard work has got into it and you prayed on it and labored on it and it's been there on your heart heavy for, for, for a length of time. Many of you have situations. It's time to call out to God. Some of you are already calling out to God and it's, it's time to continue to call out to God and believe and know that he is a rewarder. We come through very difficult times. We all do. Seasons of despair. Seasons of just low, and in that low place, we feel like there's no up, and we need that lifeline that'll pull us up. David encouraged himself. He encouraged himself, folks, from a very low place. He was in a horrible pit, he said, and he brought me up. How many of y'all have someone, loved ones, you want to pray for, need to be saved, need to know the Lord, dealing with drugs, dealing with situations, Mental, mental sickness is plaguing our land now in an unprecedented measure. My wife was talking to someone that was sharing with them the experiences of their child that are going through mental problems, entertaining thoughts of suicide, problems, problematics are, are moving in the land and people are trying to deal with their problems and because they can't deal with them, they feel the only way out is to take their own life Suicide is raging among our young children now. Young children. We need prayer. We need to pray. We need to talk. We need to share. We need the fellowship of the word of God. We need God to navigate us through this barren land. This world is falling apart. More and more, you hear the things they're saying. You know they don't know the Lord. You know they are far from him. You hear the stuff that's coming out of their mind, and we cringe now. We cringe now. I saw on the news the other day uh, in the state, I think of Jersey or somewhere, a man going to prison can decide he's a woman, and they put him in the women's prison, and then they, they, they want to know how these women end up pregnant. 
This is how sick our world is. Now we get little Bobby, and if he want to decide, he don't understand these feelings he got. He can decide he's not a man. I mean, we are in a very strange place. And you need to take charge and teach and encourage and take a stand and maybe even do bold moves. Our public schools is a disaster. A cesspool of just some of the worst thinking. And Daniel saw it. He said knowledge increased. And when knowledge increased, we start building our towers. Trying to get away from God and we can't. Young people got it fixed in their mind. They got all the answers and you don't. We need to stand in prayer and believe God that he will move and answer. Father, we come now. We need you right now. We need your strength. We need the knowledge of your word. We need that which reminds us that truly you are good. And your mercy endures throughout all generations. Father, it is not by accident. It is not by happenstance that we draw close to you. You said if we make the move, you will come closer to us. You said we'll find you if we seek you with all our heart. Father, we need so desperately you to move in our situation. For you to act on our behalf loved ones who are sick, family members who are in desperate need, but we ask that you would intervene. Father, in this room are circumstances and situations only you can fix, and we lift them up to you now, and we ask, Father, that you would touch the heart of your people and draw them closer. Draw them closer, Father we might be able, Father, in this day to stand. Stand in a world that is taking its aim. Stand in a world that is falling apart. War and rumors of war plague the land. But our eyes are upon you. And we thank you for Jesus Christ who have come and died for our sins. Thank you, Father you have provided for us a means by which we are able to be saved. I pray, Father, that you would cause us all to be mission-minded, that we might share that love and that true message of Jesus and his cross with others. Father, there's a dying world out there. Father, there are loved ones that we care about who need to know thee. If left to die in the shape they're in, we spend eternity far from you. Father, the thought of that causes us to reach out in prayer and to reach out to them and ask, Father, that you would touch their heart. Bring them in. Father, I thank you for what you have done in the lives of the people in this room. There are people in this room that have turned their heart to you. They've turned their eyes on you and the things of this world have grown strangely dim. And even though the people of the world look at them as odd and yet, Father, their eyes being fixed on you care not for what the thought of man, but that how they can please you and walk upright before you, Lord. And now that which is right looks wrong and that which is wrong looks right. But, Father, our eyes are fixed on you and your righteousness. So we call upon you to help us. No doubt with all the men in this room, we are experiencing our own personal struggles. Whatever the area may be, help that man. Help us. That we might be men of God. We might be men that can stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Father, the ladies in this room, there is no reason to think we don't all have some kind of struggle. Father, though their struggle is not the same as the others, it is their struggle. And we so firmly realize as men and women, boys and girls, children of the most high God, 
that you sent your son for us. He who knew no sin became sin. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But you have laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Now we all stand in hope. Somebody say hope. We have hope today in Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. Our struggles don't have to continue. The battle is over. We declare war. And we stand on the word of God. And we realize, Lord, there is a fight, Lord. But I thank you. We win at the end. You've given us victory. You've given us the word of God. And your word declares and it is not a lie. Let God be true and every man a lie. At the end of the chapter when all is said and done, we overcome and we come victorious before you as unspotted lambs, Father. And we thank you, Lord, that he that begun that good work is working a work of sanctification in us. You're making us more like Jesus. No wonder we don't fit in in the world, in the world's scheme, in the world's music and all of the accolades of men as they try to celebrate flesh. Oh God, our eyes are on you and we're thankful today Lord that you that begun that good work, you are faithful Lord. You're not finished with a husband. You're not finished with that wife. You're not finished with that children God. You will perfect that which is lacking in them and we thank you for it today. You will draw us by the preaching of the gospel in the faithfulness of preaching Lord. We will hear a word that will convict us that will bring us to our knees in awe of an awesome God. We like Isaiah fall on our face and say, woe is me. I am undone. And I need a savior. Yeah, I need a savior. So Father, I pray that as we in light of that need come before you, that you would strengthen us, bless us, and encourage us be ever so careful to give you the praise, the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Sister Latoya is coming to bless us in song. Drops of blood from the hand of Jesus fall on my sins cover all. He received the cross that I did. Oh 
the foot of the cross, at the foot of the cross, I pray. Jesus, remember me. Jesus, remember me. Stand with me. We're in a series. See what the Lord has done. See what the Lord has done. Somebody say all in a night. All in a night. All in a night. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Father, I thank you for your word, for we clearly see in scripture what you have done in the lives of people who are in bondage. Father, we look around and see what you have done in the lives of people in this room, 
all in one night, that moment of stepping out of darkness into your marvelous light. I thank you that on this first Sunday in May, as we celebrate around the table, we reflect on your goodness and the fact that you did remember us. You did not leave us in a world stained by sin. But in the fullness of time, you sent your son. Oh, we remember from scripture the horrors of that night as he who knew no sin became sin. The darkness that overshadowed the world that brought the greatest light that shines so bright. As our sister just reminded us, we don't want to be forgotten. Lord, I thank you that you indeed have remembered us and we stand under the auspices of grace, amazing grace, sweet to the sound because it is good. Father, minister to us. Give us ears to hear, heart to receive, and a mind to react. In Jesus' name, amen. We better understand Jesus due to this amazing event in the lives of people. Anybody in here ever read Exodus chapter 12? The story of the great exodus of the people leaving Egypt into the wilderness on the way to a land of promise. What a better depiction of Christ as we look at the elements of this truth being exposed. They were not being delivered. They were not being delivered from bad people. They were sinners themselves. This was truly the picture of grace as God delivered these folks who needed to be delivered. It was only the blood that covered them. Nothing of their own, no goodness of their own. It was, somebody said the blood. 400 years a slave. They were programmed as a slave thought of being free was something they couldn't even imagine and now here they are in one night it's all getting ready to change that day you 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 come to the lord you you didn't know it but in that one moment everything changed everything about you changed for them this is monumental a lamb was slain a lamb has to be slain so that they can escape. This transition is in one night. The thought of a prisoner, anyone who has been to jail know, and I've heard, they don't share that date with many people or anyone. The thought of being free while the children of Israel was about to be free while in the children of Israel no one was old enough to know when will this all end yet in one night some of them were born in Egypt born in slavery their forefathers were born in it remember now this is a couple of hundred years this is not somebody going to jail for 10 years or 5 years this was hundreds of years and now children got to wrap this freedom around in their mind. God begins to work on the heart of the oppressors. Nine plagues. Hardens a man hard, even harder. You know the plagues. Blood, frogs, water, emeralds, all of this. Yet in one night, one plague. While nine plagues harden his heart, one is going to cause him to let him go. Not only let them go, he will drive them out. The people had endured all their life of slavery, watching families die, loved ones die, others work until their body could no longer endure the work, while young men who thought their life would end the same way were now able to direct their energy to move into another dimension. This is great. 
What do you think as young men who were following in the footsteps of older ones? And remember, folks, you can still go and see some of the massive structures that they use these people to build. They're still standing today. They are still baffled at how they made this concrete that has lasted for thousands of years standing today are some of those structures that were built. And how do these young men look who have watched their forefathers work in the quarries of Egypt all of a sudden think the idea of working in that quarry is over? We are about to be free. They had lived their life watching older people work till they could not work no more. In this story, we don't just get the story of youth who did not understand what trans transition meant and how it impacted them. We just don't get the story of a nation being liberated. God is liberating a people, a nation of people. Somebody say with me, instructions. God give them detailed instructions because death is coming in order to escape death. These instructions are valuable. Gospel-centered instruction. Exodus 12 and 21. Moses called for the elders and says, look, tell the people, draw out, take you a lamb according to your families. Kill it, the Passover. You're going to take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel in the side post. That means the top of the door and the two sides of the door with the blood. None of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through. This is a serious instruction, y'all. God is coming through. He's telling them something they need to pay careful attention to. He's giving them instruction for their deliverance. He said, the Lord's going to pass through here. And he's going to smite the Egyptians. And when he see the blood. Now, he used the word Egyptians. But the only defining thing that's going to separate death is those who are under the blood. Remember now, there were people who had settled in Egypt who were not Egyptians. But God is dealing with the nation of Egypt. And the only way anybody can be saved is those who are under the blood. And I want to share something with you that's going to show up at the end of this message. There were people who left Egypt with Israel that were not Israelites. You know how they got saved? They heard the word of God and they put some blood on the door. They wasn't no Israelite, but they joined in. Because they heard God is coming. They heard the judgment of God is coming. So they were covered by the blood. The only way death did not come to your house is you had to follow this instruction. It was in a series of three. I got it up here. Number one, kill the lamb. Number two, apply the blood. Number three, stay Moses must communicate to what is now thousands of people. And this is why when I read the instruction, you saw he spoke to the elders who represented the camp of the 12 tribes. They had elders that would speak and they would communicate this message and get it across. You got to number one, kill a lamb. Number two, you have to apply the blood. And number three, you must stay inside. Kill the lamb. A lamb must be slain. A lamb must be slain. You just don't go get some blood. No, this has to be the blood of a slain lamb. This has to be the blood of what you have set aside for this purpose. And you notice God tells them to get a lamb. He didn't leave it up to their interpretation because you'd have had a Cain and Abel moment. Somebody just trying to give God what they want to give him. Come on, say guilty. We've been there trying to give God what we want to give him. God said, no, I'm going to fix this for you. You go get the blood of a lamb. If you, get, if you get cow's blood, put it up here, you're going to be dead. You go and get something else trying to give it to me when I don't prescribe holiness. You ain't going to make it. And our world is riddled with people who are trying to prescribe their own way. 
blood of a slain lamb is the only thing that's going to work. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, the writer of Paul says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new. Circle that word new. I know it's a little word, but it's there, and it's the highlight of this verse, because when people come to Christ, we forget the newness of who we are and the new attitude and lifestyle that goes with it. He said, you are a new lump now. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, keep the feast. This is a celebration you've been called in to keep. But you can't keep it with malice and wickedness. But sincerity and truth. So now that you kill it, you have to, somebody say, apply it. Application mean everything. We live in a day and age now where people get so much biblical information that is not applied. Maybe you're in this room and you done heard more preaching than you live up to. You know why? Because you don't apply nothing that's been said. What good is slain animal if you're not going to apply the blood? What good is our Bible if we're not going to apply it? You have to make applications to your life. It's there you find out your flesh needs to come under subjection. It's there you find out you got to get this stuff under subjection. It's there you find out an application that it's not as easy. That's why you lean and depend on him and cry out to him. And daily remind yourself of what he has said. Apply the blood. This is the prescribed way. He tells them exactly how to do it, didn't he? Top and the two sides. God has to see the blood. Can he see it in your life? Can he see that the change has happened? Listen, folks, everybody's saying they saved, but the truest proof of anyone that is saved is a changed life. Come on, it's, it's a simple. Things I used to do, I don't do. Places I used to go, I don't go. A great change in me, a change. And that change is daily. He is daily killing off you. There is constantly some of you to die to make you more like him. It's a process we call sanctification. You have to apply. Everyone must do it. My kids can't rely on me to get to heaven. Your kids can't rely on you to get to heaven. They have to make their move. They have to apply. They have to... God has to see the blood and everyone must do it. How many people are trying to live off of somebody else's confession? I thank God for grandma and granddaddy and praying parents. This dear sister had a granddaddy that prayed. He had a whole room. He had an upper room dedicated to prayer. I ain't never felt so close to the Lord going up there. Lights out, praying. I mean, they did some praying up there. Nobody can live off of his praying. They had to do their own praying. And now he's gone. Guess what? We got to pray. Thank God they laid that foundation for us. And some of you, dear folks, parents have tried to steer you and help you. But until you make application yourself, you have to apply. You have to apply. The blood applied is what's going to turn the deaf angel around. The blood is applied as we turn to Christ in our day, y'all. The blood is applied to us. We don't have to kill a lamb now. The lamb has been slain before the foundation of the earth. Jesus. That's why we sung about Jesus today. That's why we clapped about Jesus. I didn't say give Nelson a clap off, and did I? You never heard that out of me. Never will. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Give Jesus a hand clap. Give Jesus the praise. What we do is turn to Jesus. And because his blood was satisfying to the Father once and for all, now we turn to him and that applied blood went down into the grave, into the antediluvian world. And everybody that past, present, and future that turned to him can be saved. Because guess what? All the patriotic fathers that died in the days of old. That blood sacrifice they give in those animals couldn't rightfully satisfy totally all of their sin. 
It just pacified it. So when Jesus died, and when his blood was spilled, it went down, and I taught this before, it went down in the grave and redeemed those who had died. It redeemed those that was right there. That's why that thief on the cross, as she was singing, said, Lord, remember me. And guess what? Every one of us now that turn and look to the cross. That's, that's why when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, you know, he would have thought he understood all this. And he said, as Moses lifted up the brazen, that should have connected with him, shouldn't it? Jesus, we need him. Thank God for what he has done. All in a night. Things change. The allegory of this great story is that in one night, applied blood is going to spare everyone that is guilty. It doesn't change their guilt. They're getting a measure of grace. Peter said in 1 Peter 1.18, for as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. And your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with, and I love that word, precious. This is precious, y'all. Precious. The precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, he who knew no sin, becoming sin for us. This is precious. This is not cheap. This is not some easy. This is precious. He gave up his son. God went the whole distance for us. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. The intent was, I'm going to show you I love you. How far you go proves just how willing, how much love there is. He went the distance. We might starve, but man, when we see the price to pay, we can't go the distance. Because who want to give up their son? Who want to give up that which they want to keep? You and I have to admit it's not easy for us to give up that which we want to keep. Paul also said, and I did this backwards in verse 14, he said, as obedient children, Dr. Mark can be speak about the like as principle, fashioning yourself like him. As obedient children, this is the mindset you should take. As obedient children, that word children conditions us to the mindset of the children we have and how we want them to obey us. Every mom and dad should have said amen right there. Yes, yes, the children we have and how we want them to obey us. He said, as obedient children, not fashioning, not making yourself like this world to the former lust. That's why that word new is so important in the previous verse. That's the old stuff. He said, you don't do that. But as he which has called you, kaleo means you've been summoned from what you were to who you are now. You've been called to holiness. And the Bible said holiness is this fashion that is important, that is necessary to the point the writer said, you follow peace with all men, but holiness without, you won't see the Lord. I don't care who you are. You won't see him in peace. He which have called you is holy. So you be holy. And there's a little word you got to pay attention. You notice we're catching little words now. Because we like them big words because there's a big Greek word behind it or a Greek Hebrew word. But that little word, all. You don't even need Greek for it. It's all. All. You want to get fancy and get some Greek? Go ahead and get you some Greek. But all means all. All manner. That means nothing is left for private interpretation. Just say with me, ouch. We try to interpret our holiness. We try to interpret what's acceptable before God and what's not. So we believe because we got a tight envelope in this hand, we can have our porn in this hand. No, no, no. Uh, somebody say no, no, no. Yeah, we think because we got this in this hand and, and we can hold on to that in the other. Now you fill in the gaps or whatever it need to be because you know how we are with our little trinkets of holiness. We come in with our little clap and our wave and think it's okay and then go back out and do whatever. No, the Lord said, all manner. Give it a hallelujah, amen. All manner of conversation. Nothing is left to be without holiness. And then number three, say it with me, stay inside. <laughs> Our young generation don't like to hear that because we on the go. <laughs> Burning the road. Staying home is the most boring thing. And yet if you're going to be saved, the Lord said, this is what you got to do in this night. Could you imagine 
I'm sure the young people that was out and used to being out, wanted to go out, couldn't. I guarantee you there was somebody that didn't understand the instruction. Why I gotta stay inside? Why I can't go down there? Why I can't go down there? We always go down there on Thursday night, Friday night. Why I gotta stay inside? This is the instruction. In the night of judgment, there will be no safety out, out of the ark of safety. You got to stay within that blood-stained banner. You got to stay behind that door where the blood has been applied. You must stay under the blood. I want you to see my own personal note on this. There's no other name given whereby men can be saved. So don't be trying to get up under somebody else or something else. can't hide up under the faith of dad or mom or grandfather, pastor. You must come yourself. And I like this. Watch this, y'all. God does not have stepchildren, grandchildren, nieces, and nephews. No, you are children of the Lord. He has sons and daughters. Isaiah said in 26 and 20, come my people, enter into thy chambers, shut the door. You know the old folks used to have what they call shut-in service. I know I lost somebody there. They used to have a shut-in service. Shut in and just pray all night. Shut in. I mean shut, they would shut in back in them days. And they didn't shut young people up. They shut in with them old folks who prayed all night. And boy, they pray to you, fall asleep, wake up, and pray some more. They shut in, but those folks came out of those experiences with something. Now, this is, this is Isaiah. Uh, come, my people, enter into your chamber. Shut the door. The allegory here is that the outside is contaminated. You're trying to get free from the contaminants. This world, you got to admit, you get out into the luxuries of this world and it will contaminate you, contaminate your thinking. Look at where it's going. We don't even know if a man a man or a woman or a woman now. We open our borders. I just read the other day, people that are on the no-fly zone, the people that were terrorists, made it across and we don't even know where they're at. I think it's about 13 of them. People are mad because they've opened the doorway and these folks are just coming on in. They don't know who they are. And people that was on this list who couldn't get a visa and fly into the United States have crossed over in our border and they don't know where they at because at night we've been busting them everywhere just to get them all over the place. Hide yourself. The Bible says he that dwell in the secret place. Man, I found a message on that that just blessed my heart. And ever since then, I've been thinking, Lord, this is the place every believer ought to want to be. We are in the world, but not of the world. So he said, as strangers and pilgrims pass, somebody say, I'm passing through. I'm passing through. Well, act like it. Don't be trying to settle in here. Act like you're going to live here forever. Buy another, buy houses, buy a car. Buy your house, build your land, seek the peace of the city. But at the end of it, no, your car is going to end up in the junkyard right by somebody else's. Your little house, somebody's going to blow it down. If you don't yourself, it's going to all come to an end. And if you don't, it, one day or another, it's going to all burn. So don't be getting so caught up in anything you have or doing now. This ain't your best life now. I'm sorry. That preacher is not right. This ain't your best life now. As good as it getting, thank God, some of you along with me have been blessed to experience some good things in life and enjoy some things, but this is nothing compared to the glories that we will be revealed with him. Get in your secret place. Shut the door. Hide yourself. For the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. The judgment is coming. The judgment is coming. Revelation 9 and 4, he said, It is commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God 
in their foreheads. Look at the judgment that's coming for those who do not have God's approval. That's literally what the writer here, John, is saying. Those that do not have God's approval is going to be signified with a mark. The world is sure trying to put its mark on us, ain't it? And I beg to believe many of people who name the name of Christ are taking that mark. Taking that mark. You know, I found out there's a company called Torah over in Israel, Israeli-based company, who have a prototype of this going on in Germany right now. You can join in in the app, go to a store without going through a checkout or anything, purchase everything you want, and walk right on out the door. It's already calculated and deducted from your account. Cashless trade. Why are they hyped up to get you to the idea of enjoying cashless transactions? It's a setup. <laughs> it's a setup. They're getting you mentally groomed for a cashless society, a mark. Because of identity theft, they want you to all be able to join in this app. And when you activate the app to go to the store, you will be able to pick up the items. And because you are scanned as you walk in because of the app, you will be able to buy whatever you're getting. Just pick it up and walk right on out the store. And it accurately accounts for everything you picked up. My mind began to flow. Boy, what, how could they do that? Well, when you take the world's mark, and they tell you, you can't buy, sell, or trade unless you get that mark. They'll have enough knowledge and information in place to where what seems so easy and convenient can lead you right into disaster in taking that mark. God commanded them to never forget what's about to happen. This is why we sing that song, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. God don't want us ever to forget what he's done for us. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 24, he said, I want you to observe this thing for your sons forever. You don't ever forget what the Lord has done for you. And you need to share them. There are some of you as families, you went through difficulties your children don't know about. You need to tell them how God bailed you out, even if it was out of jail. You need to tell them. You need to tell them you were up against the wall and the threat of losing it all and you were sick and all. They need to know God did some things for you. They need to know your testimony. And everybody should have one. Everybody should hold on to what God has done and share it. Because in the generation to come, when they need some building power, it's not going to be in the clap. It's not going to be in the thunder of how loud they say it. It's going to be at the knowing of God and what God has done. He said, it shall come to pass when you be come to the land which the Lord will give you according to his promise. You'll keep this service. Verse 26 of Exodus 12. He said, when your children ask you, what do you mean by this? The Lord is saying, when you get over where you're going and your children ask you, what are you doing this for? You will tell them it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. In a moment, we're about to partake of the Lord's table together. And this is a reminder to us. This is a type of Christ. They are being delivered. He said, you're going to tell them it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the house of the children of Israel while we were in Egypt. Man, that's a good preaching moment right there. He said, this is the time you need to tell them when their curiosity is hot and they want to know why you're clapping like that and why you're celebrating like that and why when you think of the goodness of Jesus, your hand go to flying up and your heart begin to get heavy with praise and you want to clap and celebrate. You're going to tell them that was the time that we were stuck in bondage. I know you don't know nothing about that now. You're living in this nice house in this nice city, but we wasn't always like this. It wasn't always good like it is now. We were once in deep, deep over our head, and the Lord brought us out. The Lord delivered us, and too many people act like they deserve to be where they are, but when you remember what God has done and how he has brought you, you know 
you ought to do more than just sit here in arrogance. You know the Lord brought you. And if it had not been the Lord that was on your side, where would you be? He says, this is what you ought to do. And look at this verse. Watch this, watch this, watch this. He said, and the people bowed their head and they worshiped. Hmm. I like this. After he tells them this and gives them this instruction, they went into worship. Three major points. Well, actually five here. Number one, they were moving with a purpose. Somebody said purpose. They were moving with a purpose. They had a future. This is our verse the brother was breaking down for us. The Lord said, I got thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's the New King James Version. In the Old King James Version, he said an expected end, which really is the word hope, which is a joyful expectation. If you want the Greek key behind it, the Greek meaning behind it is a joyful expectation. Is there anybody in here expecting something? Huh? Yeah, I'm about to deliver any day now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm expecting something. I'm expecting something that has not happened yet. I'm expecting a move of God that has not moved yet. There is a joyful expectation because God has put me on the move ever since he came and got me out of the trade winds bar and delivered me and brought me over here on the Lord's side where he makes me mighty happy and makes me mighty glad. I've been on the move. Somebody said me too. He brought me. I wasn't in the trade winds, but I went. I was and because he found me and brought me out I've been on the move with a hope and a promised future I know it's not going to end like this I know the weeping that endures for the night is just a prelude to joy that's coming in the morning somebody say yes it is clap your hands and give him praise hallelujah God is doing a work in every home every family not only are they moving with a purpose, but the Lord is working all throughout the land. Folks, that purpose is on the move now, and God is doing a work. It's a solemn night of obedience. Not that they obeyed, but how they obeyed. That's important. Don't miss that point. I had to put these up here because I want you to see my bullet points. He said, it's not that they obeyed, but how they obeyed. Because remember, when Cain and Abel got ready to do offering, somebody brought an offering, didn't they? They obeyed, they brought an offering, but it wasn't what God prescribed. He didn't apply the instruction right. There is a lot of arrogance in our church world today. Well, we are warned. Um, there's a sense of awe that we're dealing with God here. His mercy, he has spared us. It's a night of solemn obedience that must be carried out. In Exodus 12 and 27, it's the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt and he smote, there it is, he smote the Egyptians, but he delivered our house. The people bowed and worshiped because they realized they too were guilty. The only reason why my house was spared is because of the blood. It's not me. It's not my clapping. It's the blood. This was, number four, severe judgment. God was dealing with them severely. Nothing to brag about. This was nothing for them to sit in their house because they're under the blood and say, nah, 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 nah. No. Death is coming. People are going to be hurt. This ain't no thing. This is a plague. God is moving. God in his judgment is going to deal with every house. And even though ministers proclaim the instruction, you better believe there were people who did not listen. I go on record to tell you, I guarantee you, there were some people who did not listen. More Egyptians could have been saved than the mixed multitude that came out. There were people who did not listen. Remember, nine plagues kept hardening one man's heart. 
When Moses came and sent the instruction, they didn't just give that instruction to Israelites. How does a mixed multitude come out? They hear the word, they apply the word, and they stay inside. This is serious. This is nobody sitting in their house all happy. and sad. They were sitting solemn, y'all, and I guarantee you, people were sitting on edge ready. Death is coming to flood the land. This is not like the locusts. This is not like water to blood now. People are going to be touched in a very real way, and you know what death does. You know how death feels. That's a horror to go to, go through, I mean. Anybody that go through the loss of a loved one know how painful that is. Whether it's a slow death, quick death, sudden, whatever. All in one night, the graves are going to fill up. In one night, the graves are going to fill up. Lives are going to be hurt. At midnight, verse 29, the Lord come through and he smote them all. Nobody got away. Nobody got away. Nobody escaped. He got them all. He went to Pharaoh's house. He went to your house, my house. He went to everybody's house. If he passed your house, it wasn't because of you. It wasn't because of what you'd done. It wasn't because of how much you gave in the offering. If he went to your house and he passed you, it's only because you did what he said. Here we are now, and everybody's crying. Could you imagine the screams? If you were sleeping, you woke up to hear the screams mothers who went to check on their baby. Come on, mamas. You know somebody's heart is broke completely in half. And you sitting here realizing the only way, the only reason you're not crying is not because of any goodness of my own. It's because of him. See what the Lord has done. We're sitting here today, and the only reason why we're sitting here today is because of him. He spared us and allowed, as the old deacon say, our golden moments to roll on. Pharaoh rose up in the night in verse 30. He and the Egyptians, there was a great cry. Why? Everybody's crying. Everybody who is not covered, some death in your house. If your firstborn was 40 year old, guess what? He's dead. If your firstborn was three weeks old and they ain't had a chance to sin, they died. The only thing spared is the grace of God. The Bible said there was a great cry, for there was not a house that was not touched. There was not a house where there was not at least one dead. Lifeless bodies, you're crying and pulling on. Pleading, come back. I guarantee you there was somebody crying out to God saying, please, Lord, don't let her go now. Don't let him die now. Don't take my child now. Don't take my husband now. There was somebody shaking and crying and pleading with God. If they never prayed, I bet they were praying then and crying out to the one true God. They might have been calling on whoever it was, Pharisees, Pharisees or whatever. But I guarantee you when God came through, somebody was praying that God wasn't praying before. Sometimes we sit in church with so much arrogance like we deserve to be here. Not true. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift, not a works lest any man. What are you boasting about? What did the church got to be named after you about? Why you got to write a book and put your picture on it? 
What's going on? This was a great cry, and lifeless bodies are everywhere. The morticians are about to get more busy than they ever wanted to be. Morticians, we used to think them some money-hungry, greedy folks, didn't we? When COVID came sweeping through, man, them folks were overwhelmed and hurting and wore down and couldn't keep up with the pace of bodies. Some had, in bigger cities, they had to rent trucks to put bodies in, and we're told of mass graves and burials and, and cremation and all this stuff that was happening because death was moving so fast. This judgment was against sin and no one was pardoned, rich or poor. They had killed, the Egyptians had murdered and killed 80, they, uh, uh, murdered and killed off Israel. They killed the firstborn. Now you know what it feel like. Remember Moses was spared, but they killed all the firstborn in Egypt. You better be careful what you putting out. God might make sure it come back to you. Pharaoh didn't realize when he made that decree, go kill the firstborn because you cocky and got power. Don't mean to need, you need to exercise that any kind of way. Be not deceived. God is not mocked whatsoever a man sow, that shall he also reap. This is what they did to Israel, and now God does it to them. Now see how I feel. little men going around here trying to be players bragging about these girls heart you break God will make sure yours get broke don't be playing with somebody's feelings you don't mean them right get out their face I just thought I'd slide that in I don't really care I just slid it in there I know it, it don't fit but it fit 80 years now God has them to feel what it feel like and guess what say it with me it don't feel that hot yeah, why you lying on somebody, not somebody lying on you. It don't feel that hot, do it. Taking advantage of somebody, not somebody taking advantage. It don't feel that good, do it. Now they're here, and I'm telling you, I guarantee you, somebody thought about it. I bet they thought, you know what? We killed all the firstborn. Now God's killing ours. Number five, absolute deliverance. Woo, this is absolute. I got to get to the end of this. No condition, no opposition. Go on, go now. Take all your stuff. I showed you before how Pharaoh wanted to say, leave your children, keep your money. I showed y'all that, didn't I? Remember that? Nah, don't keep your money. Take your money with you. Take your children. Take your stuff and get up out of my face. I don't want to see you no more. This is absolute. When God does what he do, y'all, he don't have to do it. The devil don't want to hang on to no part of you. Get all of it and go. I want you to leave. I've been wanting to leave. Take all your stuff. That's what I tried to do. Take your children. I told you that. Take your money. Yes, I told you that. Take all your cattle. I told you I didn't know if God want five of my cows or ten. I can't do, give him what I want if I leave it in Egypt. In verse 31, he called for them by night. Who does that? Somebody that's in a hurry. <laughs> Who does that? Call for you by night. Somebody that's anxious to get rid of you. Well, there's a verse. Come on, I'm not just talking. Rise up now. Get out of here. Well, let's read it like it said. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up, get you forth from among my people. Sound like he want them out. Both you, your children. Oh, what? You tried to keep them before. Go, serve the Lord. I can't hold on to you no more. As ye have said. All the stuff he wanted them to leave. Take your flock, your herd. And then look at this. Bless me. You ever read something and then look like something don't fit? This is one of, come on, y'all, give me a few moments. I might be a little. Go, get all your stuff, do all this. And then at the end, bless me. I'm 
I'm not making this up. There it is. Give me a blessing. You done been hard-hearted nine times. God had to kill your child in order for you to wake up. Now you want a blessing. Do you think God is able to bless him? If he repent and genuinely, God is able to bless him. Sometimes some severe things is what it takes to humble us, isn't it? He didn't ever ask for a blessing when, when Moses first came to him. No. He called magicians. They threw their ride down. Theirs turned to a snake. He said, get on out of here. I don't need y'all. Hard got hard. Now he's saying, you go, but give me a blessing. Now we got a sinner looking for a blessing. A sinner. A rank sinner. <laughs> You know what a rank sinner is. A rank sinner want a blessing. This is Pharaoh. He was a God himself. People prayed and bowed to him and all of that. Now he's saying, I need a blessing. God know how to humble us, y'all. He know how to take us off our little throne and humble us. If you were up there, I'm not worried about you. God know how to bring you down. If I get up there, God know how to bring me down. We know that others have been saved. We know others could have been saved. And I shared this before. If they'd have just listened to what was being said. Under the sound of my voice are people who have the same opportunity as the person they're sitting next to. But somebody's going to apply what's being said and maybe someone won't. I don't know. Only God knows. But I know one thing. When it was time for them to go, in the middle of the night, a mix. A mixture. Twelve 38 of Exodus says a mixed multitude. There it is. Say with me, it's in the mix. I almost titled that. I almost gave this message that title. It's in the mix. God mixed it up. God is showing us something even back then that is inclusive of Gentiles going out with Hebrews. Look in this room. There's a couple of different nationalities represented here. So when we come together, we got to have more than collard greens. Thank God we do because there's a mixture of people with different backgrounds and ethnicities. Because we're mixed, we'll do that, won't we? There's a mixture. There are other people that listen to the gospel. There are other people that listen to the instruction. This is what I'm trying to get at. There are other people that heard what God said and said, look, I know I'm not like you. I know I don't look like you. I know I don't clap like you. I don't sing like you. But there's something about that God that's in you. I want him. There's something about that God in you that delivers you. I want to be delivered. There's something about that God that has brought you out of this place. I want to go with you. And if you say God is coming, I want to apply some blood and I want to get up out of here too because I'm sick and tired of this myself. So I'm going to hear the word of God. I know I'm not like you. I know I don't have the praise you have. I don't have the ability you have. But I believe God. And if I can believe God just like you, I want to come out of this stuff just like you. So I'm going to kill a lamb. I'm going to apply the blood. And I'm going to stay inside. And I'm going to believe God that he's coming back again. I'm going to believe God that he's coming again us and if I'm not ready I'm going to be left here but when he cracked that sky I want some getting up power I want to get up out of here and be ready to go with the Lord so the Bible says this is a night a mixed multitude they came out of Egypt with their flocks with their herd everybody had their cattle look at somebody and tell them I'm coming and I'm bringing all my stuff with me I'm not going to leave my money in Egypt I'm not going to leave my children in Egypt. We're coming out. And for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. One can never forget a night like this. Somebody say, I'll never forget. All in one night, he changed me. All in one night, he delivered me. All in one night, he brought me out. Somebody clap your hand. Give God praise. Hallelujah. So the 
Bible says in verse 42, I remember he said, tell me, how did you feel when you came out of the wilderness?
cup. What cup is good that don't hold substance? We don't hold on to a cup that can't hold substance, do we? We throw it away because it has to hold substance. And then what substance is in it? What good is it unless it's poured out? Most of you thirsty don't you know, fill up a glass of water just to look and say, there's a glass full of water. We pour it out. God saves us to fill our lives with him so that we can pour him out into the world. We pour him out on our job. They shouldn't tell us you're, a big, you're, you're one bigger hellion than everybody else. You should be pouring out love and peace. You should be the reason why there is some harmony and, and some, 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 some grace there. They should feel they cannot get along without you because you are the fragrance of God in that aroma because he has broken you and you allow that brokenness to take place. And out of that brokenness, you serve. That's what it's all about, serving, isn't it? Jesus served mankind. He served. And he gave us that example that the greatest among us must be served. No. The greatest among us serves. That's why you'll come in and you'll find people serving. Because we love the Lord and we want to be of use. Broke my will so that his will be done. So the brother come. He's going to share. I invite you to share with us. If you're home or whatever, I invite you to come share with us as we embrace what the Lord has done. Don't know how what you did.
pray that you would be an offering and pour it out. You can be poured out into this world. Use me. Use me as an offering that is poured out to this ministry, to my co-workers, my family. Help us. Help us. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood that makes us white as snow. May we be an offering that is poured out that will help others in Jesus' name.